Hello, today we're going to discuss a phenomenon known as short-term synaptic plasticity. Uh, there are two types of short-term synaptic plasticity known as synaptic depression and synaptic facilitation. Uh, both of these two effects happen inside of almost all of the synapses in the brain and they control how strong the synapse is. That is to say, they control how much the synapse affects the downstream neuron. In this context, the word depression means that the synapse gets weaker, and the word facilitation means that the synapse gets stronger. Uh, these phenomena happen every time the synapse activates, every time the presynaptic neuron emits an action potential, and then the synapse transmits that electric impulse across to the postsynaptic dendrite, uh, then the synapse can get stronger or weaker because of these two phenomena. Uh, but this is a short-term change, it's temporary, and the effect fades away after a brief period of time, and the synapse returns to its original state after a little while. Uh, short-term synaptic plasticity lets synapses analyze their recent activity, and they can do all sorts of interesting things using that capability. Okay, uh, first we're going to discuss synaptic depression. Uh, synaptic depression is when the synapse stops responding for a short while due to overactivity. It's illustrated by this diagram here. So the x-axis is time, and the y-axis is the magnitude of the effect of the synapse on the postsynaptic dendrite. You know, what the synapse does to the postsynaptic neuron and each of the red marks on the x-axis indicates when an action potential passes through the presynaptic axon and into the synapse. So you can see here that the first time the synapse receives an action potential, it has a large effect, but then every subsequent action potential has a weaker and weaker effect. And by the fourth action potential, the synapse has basically stopped responding. It's gone silent, and it basically just ignores that action potential. But after a short pause, the synapse recovers back to full strength. It goes back to normal. There are several reasons why synaptic depression happens. The primary reason that it happens is that the synapse runs out of the chemicals that it needs in order to function. Uh, basically, synapses require a bunch of different chemicals in order to work correctly and to have an effect on the postsynaptic dendrite. And synapses keep a stockpile of those chemicals on hand so that they can work. But after those chemicals are used up, then they have to take a little break to replenish their chemical reserves. And the brain can control this process by controlling how much of those chemicals it saves up, and by controlling how quickly it replenishes its chemical reserves after they get used up. And this allows the brain to control how depressed the synapse gets, and how quickly it recovers from its depression. Depression can also be caused by something called receptor desensitization, which is when the receptors get stuck in a closed state. Uh, the postsynaptic dendrite has ion channels embedded in its cellular membrane in the vicinity of the synapse, and basically these are little doorways that can open up when the synapse activates and they let electricity into the neuron in the form of electrically charged ions, and this causes, you know, this causes the postsynaptic synaptic effect. And after the synapse is done activating, then those doorways close to cut off the flow of electricity, but sometimes those doors get slammed shut too hard, and they can actually get stuck closed as a result. And it can take uh, a few seconds for them to wiggle themselves free. They're not actually broken, they're just a little jammed up for a moment, and that can cause this depression effect. The other effect is synaptic facilitation. Facilitation refers to when synapses build up their strength and they get stronger after every time they're used. And I've drawn a diagram of it in action here. Again, the x-axis is time, and the y-axis is the effect of the synapse on the postsynaptic neuron. And again, these little red marks indicate when a presynaptic action potential passes through the axon and into the synapse. As you can see here, 
The first time the synapse received an action potential, there was almost no response. The synapse basically just ignored the first action potential that it received. But then each subsequent action potential had a larger and larger effect, and by the fourth action potential, we've reached the full maximum strength. And then after a little delay, uh, the effect of facilitation diminishes, but it does linger and remain for a little while afterwards. Synaptic facilitation is caused by a series of chemical reactions happening inside of the synapse. And once again, the brain can control the magnitude of this effect and how long the effect persists for by controlling those chemical reactions. Uh, the brain controls the concentrations of the chemical reagents, and it controls how quickly the products of the chemical reactions are cleared out and removed from the synapse. In particular, it controls the level of calcium ions inside of the presynapse. Okay, now let's discuss the purpose of these two mechanisms. What are they doing? Clearly, short-term synaptic plasticity allows synapses to analyze the recent history of synaptic inputs to alter how the synapse will respond in the immediate future. The synapse can take fundamentally different actions based on the number of action potentials that it receives, and also based on how close together in time those action potentials are. Rapid or tightly grouped action potentials can be treated differently than slow or spread out action potentials. Now, these two effects are building blocks. They're not complete algorithms on their own, but rather they can be used as components of other larger things. And scientists have a lot of cool ideas about what the brain is doing with these two effects. Many of their ideas are compatible with each other. There could be multiple different things happening in different parts of the brain using the same building blocks just assembled in different ways to form, you know, different things. Um, one of the things that synaptic depression is doing is something called gain control or normalizing the input magnitude. So the idea here is that your sensory organs measure the magnitude of a stimulus and they encode that magnitude into the number of action potentials that they transmit to your brain. So a light and gentle touch against a single hair on your arm might elicit one or two action potentials, but a heavy and forceful punch might cause dozens or hundreds of action potentials to be sent to your brain. And the dilemma that your brain faces is how can it process both situations to be able to respond to that painful barrage of inputs while also being sensitive to a single hair being moved out of place. And the solution involves simply ignoring the excessive inputs. Like after the first half dozen or so inputs, we get the message, and just for the purpose of figuring out what's going on, we can probably ignore some of the uh, repeated and excessive inputs. Um, and in this way, a weak stimulus and a strong stimulus can have similar effects on the brain, and they can be processed in similar ways by the same neurons and using the same neural circuitry in both situations. Something that facilitation is doing is that it implements a form of short-term memory. You can see that in this diagram here. When we initially encountered a stimulus, we had a weak effect, but then we built up our strength through the facilitation mechanism, and that facilitation can last for a while. Even though we stopped using the synapse for a few moments, we still remember that it was previously used. And then when we use the synapse again, we get the larger effect immediately without needing to build up the facilitation. The synapse remembers that it was facilitated. And this effect gets much more interesting when you consider that you have a whole network of neurons that are all connected to each other. And when you activate a subset of those neurons, uh, then the connections out of those active neurons will strengthen because of, you know, synaptic facilitation. And this can form a short-term memory. You can embed specific memories inside of a larger network, and then those neurons can be reactivated using the strongly facilitated synapses.
And when you reactivate a memory, then this causes further facilitation of those synapses, which refreshes that memory to keep it from fading away. And in this way, you can have a memory that is embedded in the network, but that doesn't require continuous activity. You have this pause in neural activity where you can be like thinking about other things, and then you can come back to this memory later. Um, and indeed, scientists have found a lot of evidence supporting this particular theory about short-term memory. Now let's move on from theory into the realm of hypothesis. A hypothesis for what short-term synaptic plasticity is doing is that it's reconstructing an analog signal. You see, neurons, they have a voltage across their membrane, and that's an analog value. Uh, the membrane voltage is caused by thousands of synapses, each adding or subtracting a little bit of electricity to form a complicated voltage signal. And then the axon could be compressing that voltage signal into a series of binary pulses, which are of course known as action potentials. But short-term synaptic plasticity, if configured correctly, could reconstruct the original analog signal of the voltage at the cell's soma, or cell body, even after it's been compressed into some kind of binary digital format. Um, and finally, my personal favorite hypothesis about short-term synaptic plasticity has to do with conscious attention. The hypothesis is that neurons in the neocortex, they represent the importance of a piece of information using the number of action potentials that they emit. Normally, information is represented by single action potentials, but important information could be represented by rapid bursts of action potentials. And when I say important, I mean important for your own personal behavior. Importance is obviously a subjective thing. You see, most of the things that you sense are not important. Most of the time, you're not paying attention to things like the noises in the background or the colors of the walls. Normally, such things are not important, and so the neurons that detect them, they emit a single action potential, and that says to the rest of the brain, hey, there's this thing over here, but it's probably not important. But after I called your attention to it, then those same neurons are going to start emitting rapid bursts of like three to six action potentials, which says to the rest of the brain, hey, there's this thing over here, and it's the thing that you're looking for. So when a neuron emits a rapid burst of action potentials, it could be a signal that you should pay extra attention to that neuron. And short-term synaptic plasticity could allow synapses to filter for each type of information. Depression causes synapses to respond to both single action potentials and bursts of action potentials in more similar ways. Synaptic depression makes synapses focus on the literal message of the neuron, but ignore the importance of the message. Facilitation, on the other hand, causes synapses to respond only to those rapid bursts of action potentials which signal important messages. Facilitation causes synapses to ignore the unimportant messages that are represented by single action potentials. What's more is that scientists have figured out what causes neurons to emit these rapid bursts of action potentials. At least in the neocortex, rapid bursts are caused by a special type of dendrite known as the apical dendrite on pyramidal neurons. And these special dendrites are strongly facilitating, meaning that they're only sensitive to the things that you're paying attention to. So, to say that again, the apical dendrites of pyramidal neurons only respond to the things that you're paying attention to, and they respond by sending out the signal to pay more attention to those things. So, it appears that there are two systems running throughout the whole cortex. One system deals with just the literal facts of the world, and it uses single action potentials to represent those literal facts. And the other system only cares about the important facts, and it represents those with extra action potentials in rapid bursts. And these two systems are built using the same neurons, and they communicate on the same axons.
but they have different signaling protocols and all of the synapses in the brain, they can differentiate between those two types of signals. Um, this hypothesis is supported by a lot of evidence and there are a lot of fascinating details that I've left out for the sake of time. Uh, this hypothesis could explain a lot of things. In particular, it could explain some of the exciting phenomenon of consciousness. But still, I'd like to temper my enthusiasm and emphasize that this is a hypothesis and it's still being developed. Um, anyways, that's all I have time for today. I hope you've learned something interesting, and so until next time, meow.